This is a work based on an old paper uh, published uh, five years ago. And we did publish after that. But the reason I'm focusing on this old paper because this is the core of a collaboration between me and Mike, a collaboration, in my opinion, that already has been very fruitful. Uh, and the hope is, as we expose you to the work, that more and more of the young kids will be willing to come with us and help us in this project that I believe is a very exciting project. Okay? okay. The title of the talk is The Analysis of a Protein Network that Regulates Fat Storage in Yeast. Okay, I'd like to start uh, with a brief introduction. As many of you know, uh, biological pathways are organized as a network. Uh, understanding their property is essential uh, for preventing their collapse and to effectively control the propagation of events uh, going through them. Um, uh, most biological networks that we are dealing with were generated using a genome-wide method, followed by emphasis on something we call essential genes. What are essential genes? They are genes that when you break them, the organism die. And that's why they are called essential genes. They are essential for survival. Uh, the main problem of this approach, as some of you know, when you use a global method for detecting protein-protein interaction, you will catch most interaction. But some of you already know that gene A, protein A will bind to protein B to regulate the cell cycle. But protein A will bind to protein C to regulate apoptosis. And if you look at this global interaction, you have no way of knowing. The networks that we need are networks like not only A and B bind to one another, but they are involved in the same biological process. So instead of this, we want networks like this. The second problem uh, of network analysis in biological science lately is most of the focus, as I said, have been into essential genes. And those genes' contribution to a biological network can be scored only as dead or alive. Uh, you know, basically all nodes here will have basically the same contribution. But most of you know that biological pathways tend to have a graduated output most of the time. And it will be good if we can put this information into the network architecture. So we want to know which node contribute to which level in the network. So the old way of analysis will not can allow you to do that. The third major defect of the old way of doing this is also that since if you're focusing on essential gene, at the end of the day, you are dealing with a dead cell. You can only go so far. You cannot really examine alteration in downstream components. What we want, we, we want uh, an information in which not only all the proteins known to involve in the same process, not only we can evaluate our contribution to the network output, but we are not dealing really with a dead uh, cell when you remove those proteins, so we can analyze alteration in downstream components. Okay. So those are the problems that are currently available in biological networks. As some of you know, uh, already know, guess from the title, we were interesting in the, interested in developing a yeast as a model to understand the genetic base of fat accumulation in a single cell. And yeast, as some of you know, is a great system to work with for many reasons. The two major reasons in our book is that we have the availability of a haploid serine collection in which every single gene is removed. We have 6,000 genes in yeast, and we have a collection we can order in 96 well format in which every gene is being removed and we can examine. And also yeast, we have very extensive protein to protein interaction networks already being published. So the screen was successful and we have identified a close to 91 genes. And those 91 genes seem to encode proteins that are physically binding to one another. And about 70% of those genes are evolutionally conserved, and they have been, some of them have been hypothesized to be involved in fat storage. And I will go into detail how did we identify those genes and how did we construct the network. But we were quickly struck that this network provide a good opportunity to basically uh, remove the criticism that we already had mentioned in the old way of analyzing biological network, mainly that the two proteins now in this network we know are now involved in the same process. A and B not only bind to one another, but both of them are involved in fast storage regulation. So that's good. We have specificity. Not only that, the output of a given protein to the network output can be easily evaluated by simply measuring how much fat the yeast is when you remove this gene. So you have gene A and B. And when you remove A, the yeast is much more fatter than removing B. So you can now evaluate experimentally the importance of that gene to the output of the fat network. Again, that's all uh, a major criticism. The third thing is that 
those yeasts are alive. They are not dead when you remove those genes. So we can analyze alteration downstream components. Now here's a detail of the screen. How do we identify those genes? First thing we have done, we order the mutant in 95, 98 well format. We grow those mutants. And after two days, we fix them and we stain them. And we stain them with two stains. One stain is DABI, nuclear stain, which provides a convenient method of normalizing the number of cells from one well to the other. The other stain is nile red, which is a fluorescent stain that will fluoresce when it binds to lipid. And we looked for mutants that have abnormal ratio of DAPI to nile red, like here, SNF1, SNF4. We further confirmed that those mutants are of peace by looking and examining them visually using a different fluorescent dye, just to make sure, or DB. And you can see here the same mutant here. He uses normal yeast cells with uh, five to seven fat droplets, or DB. And you can see here the mutant SNF4 that have many large, big lipid droplets. And the final stage of confirmation is not fluorescent, is a biochemical method using thin layer chromatography. We take the mutant, crush them, extract the fat, and run it on TLC plates, and you can see here the mutant here for replica have a very large fat band as compared to normal. And we confirm this band is indeed fat band by basically taking it from the TLC plate and send it to the mass spec facility. And they told us, don't worry, it's actually nothing but a little bit fat. Okay, so when we done this, as I said earlier, we identify, sorry, we identify 94 fat storage regulating gene. This is an ugly slide, but it illustrates a point. We discover that those genes include, include, encode proteins that are physically connected to one another, forming a large and extensive network. Let me guide you through the slide. The color here represents the molecular function of the protein. So the green here are MAP kinases. The uh, purple here are actually TOR kinase and autophagy proteins. The light blue here are basically mRNA deadenization and degradation. And the red here basically a transcription factor. Two things I want you to take from this figure. The size here reflect, uh, basically represents how fat is the yeast when you remove this gene. So you can see here, removing them one protein, the yeast become much more fatter than removing STE part. That's the first take home message that I want you to take from this figure. The second thing I want you to take from this figure is those red lines. Those red lines basically are, those protein actually bind to one another. And the binding was detected by co-precipitation but using mass spec, so it's like a western plot. And some of you know, you only detect those binding if they are abundant and stable. So actually they are very solid binding. So this is how the network looks. Now I'm gonna take you in detail into this network. Uh, this network have a very compelling molecular logic. The first component we notice in this network, it have what we call energy detection modules. The first one is M kinase. M kinase is an evolutionary conserved enzyme that is activated among nutritional stress to tell the cell, okay, don't store fat. You are too hungry, you don't have fat. This is not the time to do it. And any mutation that break it will give the cell a wrong impression, no, no, everything is fine, you have extra energy, go and synthesize fat. So it makes sense that the M kinase is part of the network. We did not start as thinking it should be, but it turned out to be. The other energy detection mo uh, module is the MTH1 protein. MTH1 protein is a protein in yeast that is degraded when the yeast is incubated in high sugar level. So any mutation that remove it will give the yeast a false impression that you have too much sugar. Go ahead, store it as fat. So again, it makes sense that this protein is part of the network. Now those are energy detecting modules have a direct molecular link to the following pathways. The first pathway is the TOR kinase, a pathway that is known to be involved in uh, uh, metabolism regulation, and also the VM1 proton pump, also known to be involved in autophagy, but its role is not being deciphered thoroughly yet as much as the TOR kinase. The other things is, of course, enzymes are involved in fatty acid synthesis, such as a steroid synthesis pathway, uh, uh, ACC, which is uh, acetylcholine carboxylase, the main enzyme involved in fatty acid synthesis. Uh, we have also uh, a lot of the MAP kinases. Initially, we were surprised why we are picking a lot of MAP kinases, but later we discover that the MAP kinase in yeast is activated again among nutritional stress. So it makes sense that uh, any mutation that remove it give the yeast a false impression of nutritional access. But we did not know that when we first started this work. 
and of course, mRNA de-aggregation and degradation. Again, we don't know why mRNA degradation is involved in this process, but we seem to be picking a lot of them. And of course, transcription pathways. Okay. Now, the first thing we have done computationally, we analyze this network to see can we define a much more fine grained structure inside this network. And one of the things we have done, we have done something called walk trap algorithm to detect communities or complex inside this network. Uh, the algorithm is very simple. You start with a short random walks by the computer, and you do thousands of those walks, and you track their pattern. And walks will be trapped inside things that are in the same community. So at the end, you have a network like that. But at the end of doing the walk trap algorithm, you can define that network and divide it to a smaller substructure inside. And when we've done that to our network, we discover, not to our surprise, that we managed to divide it using the walk trap algorithm into six major communities. And all of them agree with the literature that those are complexes. They, you know, all the MAP kinases are together, heavily binding with one another. The VMA proton pump are binding together, and so forth. So forth. Okay. Now, here's when it gets really exciting. One of the things we attempted to do here, we know now we can evaluate experimentally the importance of a given protein to the network output by simply removing it. If you remove A and the yeast is much more fat than the removing B, then you know the protein A is more important. Makes sense. But can we use the location of the protein in the network to mathematically predict this will be important? or not. Can we predict if this is important, not based on experiment, but based on its location in the network? And one of the things we look for is something used in network theory called centrality. What is centrality? Centrality is a method to evaluate the impact of a given node on the network output. And there are many forms of centrality. The most simple form is what we call degree centrality, in which an important protein is a protein with the most connection. <coughs> Very simple, straightforward. Another form of centrality is something we call between the centrality. The most important protein is not the protein with the highest connection, but the protein that functions frequently as a path of communication between other proteins. So you can see here, it's not the most highly connected protein. But according to between the centrality, this is the most important protein. So out of those variety of measurement, different centrality, which one seem to agree with the experimental data? And we discover it's a cat centrality. What's the cat centrality? In the cat centrality, the most important protein is a protein that functions as a short path of communication, true, but only to its immediate neighbors. For things that are slightly far away, you score them less. So what's good about the cat centrality, it's not only tell you this is very important for your community, but it also has some sort of evaluation to your general impact on the network as a whole and seem to be the best, the most predictive centrality when it comes to looking at this protein. So this is a very important point. Can we use the location of the protein to predict it's important or not using the experimental data we have as a method of check? And the answer is yes, and we discovered it's a cat centrality. By the way, feel free to interrupt this is a small group to give your question and comment. Okay. So we have this network, we understand its structure, but is there any computational methods that can generate networks with similar feature. And there are three major models that are used in network theories to basically predict, to basically to analyze network structure. The first model is what we call the Ardash Rani. The second model is the watts rogat And the last and most famous model is the scale three models. In the Ardash Rani model, its main feature that every node has the same number of connection as any other node. There is no center. That's the main feature of the Ardash Rani network. In the watts rogat it's the same thing, that every node has the same number of connection as any other node. But they have a tendency to form those con connections with their immediate neighbor. And as time goes by, that makes them form what we call click groups, friends together. Okay? The final model, which the uh, one received a lot of attention, is the scale-free uh, model. In the scale-free model, is you have few nodes, we call them hubs that hugs most of the connection. They are the richest one. They hug most of the connection. Majority of the nodes have very few connections. And you can distinguish between those models using their mathematical properties. Uh, for the scale-free, they tend to have what we call power law distribution, that only few nodes hug most of the connection. Where for the Watts-Rogat and Erdashani, you have a nice Poisson distribution. 
that because most of the nodes have the same number of connections. Another feature that we can use to distinguish between the models is what we call clustering. If, pro if node A binds to protein B and B binds to C, then C, how frequently the C is also binding to A. And things that are was rogat or scale-free tend to be highly clustered, where r dash tend to be like that, okay? And the last feature is modularity. Basically, what's the tendency of the nodes to form a click group with one another? And I guess you already figured out that the was rogat is a very highly performance of this. So when we look at those computational models, which one of them fit the description of our network? And the answer was was rogat. We expected initially when we started the work that our network is scale-free, but we discovered no, it's not scale-free, it's what's wrong. Okay. This might sound like a mathematical mumbo-jumbo of not really be relative, relevant to biologists, but no, actually, this might give you a predictive power. If you can computationally describe the feature of the network, you can have some mathematical feature that you can now examine and predict in the biological system. Let me illustrate the point here. The first thing is modularity. As I mentioned already, the was rogat and the scale three tend to be modular, where the r dash rani tend not to be modular. I mean by modularity that nodes like to form connection with their neighbor. Modularity is good because it allows you to have multifunctionality. The network now can divide part of its feature to be optimized to a certain subtask. You can do that very easily, at least structurally. For the r dash rani because there is no click group, it tends to be jack of all trade and master of none. So our network is modular. Does that translate to multifunctionality? I will examine that and show you the data later. The other thing that the mathematical property of the network will help you to predict is something called buffering. Some people call it robustness, but I like to say buffering. If you notice here, if you remove those nodes, you will have different consequences on the network architecture as compared, uh, depending on what type are they. So if we remove this node in Ardash Rani, you can see the network is pretty much intact. It's fine, it's very robust. And the same thing for a Watts Rogat, when you remove this node, the structure is intact. But look what happened when you remove the hub. Half of the network is destroyed. So since our network is Watts Roga, we predict that most likely it will have a lot of buffering, a lot of robustness. And I will show you the experiment in which we examine that. Another thing you can do with those computational models, you will have a prediction of the traffic flow. You can see here, because there is no center in the Ardosh Rani and Watts Roga, every node can be visited. There is no node that is more important for the signal traffic than, than other. But if you design a city as a scale-free, you notice that most path will lead to the hubs. Is that true in our network? And I will show you the experiment that do uh, We think mathematically our network should be like this, not like this. And I'll show you the data in which we examine this. So what we are doing now in the rest of the talk is that, okay, we have those mathematical properties. Do they agree with the experimental reality of our system? And that's the main purpose of this talk. We haven't used it really for solid prediction. We just want to see, OK, this is how it looks. Does it agree with the experiments? OK. The first thing we examine, as I said, is modularity. Urdashwani networks who are not modular, and they tend to be jack of all trades and master of none, where, where Wax Rogat and Scale 3 have modular. So that will allow them to have different subtasks. How can we examine modularity in terms of biological context? Well, we set a list of possible subtasks that our network can generate. The first thing is lipid morphology. How does the fat droplet look at different mutants in our network? And do they map to a certain module? The second thing is fat store degradation during starvation. Maybe our mutants are fat because the moment you give them food, they synthesize fat just fine. But when times come from them to cash in on their fat supply, they start to end up to have a net accumulation of fat. So they store fat just fine, but when it's time to take that fat, they cannot do so, and that leads to net accumulation of fat as time goes by. The second thing, uh, the third thing is, maybe our mutants are fat because the moment you give them food, they quickly convert it to fat. There is no break on the system. So we sat around now to examine those issues one by one 
and see how do they match the network architecture, okay? The first thing we examine, okay, uh, lipid droplet morphology. This is how normal yeast look. And you can see here, normal yeast have nice uniform distribution fat droplet from three to seven. And when we look at our mutant, we notice that we can easily divide them, divide them into three categories. The first category is the lipid droplets are small but numerous, very small but numerous. The second category is a mix of small and numerous, but you have normal lipid droplets too. The third category is they have the supersized lipid droplets. Now we analyze those mute, all of those mutants and see now how do they match the network architecture. And this is what we found. You can see in all cases, things that examine the same lipid morphology tend to be connected to one another in the network, but they tend to belong to different molecular categories. They are not in the same module. They are in different modules. Same thing for all the rest categories. And we confirm that their connection to one another is not random because the network form is highly clustered as compared to random model with the same number of proteins, same number of connections. So that's one thing we discover. Yes, we have subtasks, but they do not seem to agree with the module's boundary. The second thing, as I said, maybe they are fat because the moment they synthesize fat, they cannot cash in on it. And as time goes by, that leads to net accumulation of fat. How can we examine that? Well, simply starve them and see what happens. So this is normal yeast, and when you starve it to the third day, you can see the fat pad become less. And when we examine our mutants one by one, we notice many of them, their fat remain the same. They rather die than to use their fat. And they do that eventually. Now, when we look at those mutants, where do they fit? Again, the same feature. They belong to different molecular categories, but they are connected to one another to form a subnetwork. And we've done a little cute experiment. Uh, yeast, like many of us, can only use fat as a source of energy if they have a normal mitochondria. Does that mean those mutants have an abnormal mitochondria? It's very easy to examine that in yeast. You simply grow yeast with glycerol. Yeast can only grow in glycerol but have a normal mitochondria. And we examine nearly in all cases, this is normal yeast in different dilution, they grow just fine. But you notice in all cases, those are two mutants, those yeasts have difficulty growing in glycerol, which indicate that they have a problem in mitochondria. Maybe that's why they cannot use fat. To, uh, as a source of energy, their mitochondria is broken. And again, this network seems to have a uh, highly clustered, something more that can be generated in normal circumstances. Okay. What about the third aspect of multifunctionality, modularity? Maybe they are fat because the moment you give them food, they quickly synthesize fat. The system is broken. They cannot put a broth in the process. How can we examine that? We simply fed them radioactive aspartic acid. And then we homogenize this yeast and isolate uh, lipid alone, carbohydrate alone, and protein alone, and just evaluate where does the radiation go. With things that have defect of converting high rate of aspartic to fat, they will have higher rate of radiation in the fat fraction. And again, we discover that close to 30 to 40 percent of the mutants have this defect. Again, they are connected to one another to form a subnetwork that is highly clustered as compared to normal. So. Do we have multifunctionality in our network? The answer is yes. But what we expected, we expected something like this. Things in the same modules will have the same subtask. But what we end up, we end up with something like this. That different subtasks are car carried by different proteins that belong to different modules, but they are still nevertheless connected with each other to form a subnetwork with highly clustered that is more than anything that can be generated by random. So we can say it's, the mathematic was partially correct and partially wrong, okay? Okay, what about buffering? Remember I showed you by the diagram that the network architecture sometimes tell you this network will be robust or not. How can we examine this robustness if our network is robust or not? The architecture detects because of that it will be robust, but is it really robust when we do experiments? How to test that? Well, we decided to test that by generating double mutants. Hit, generate a yeast in which you have double mutants. And with set of predictions. The first prediction, if the network is not robust, every protein do its own job independently of the other, 
then when we mutate gene A or gene B and compare the fat level of the double mutant, it will be perfect summation of both. Perfect summation, because they are, not, they are working independently from one another. That's what you get if every node, every pathway, is working independently from one another. If there is no buffer. Another possibility, and this has nothing to do with buffering, if they are in the same pathway, protein B, convey the message to protein A, lead to fat level, then if you broke A, even if B is around, it's like you broke in B, and vice versa. And when you create a double mutant in this case, you, ha you have no increase in fat. It's like examining one mutant. This is, I'm not going to call this robustness, I'm going to call it in the same pathway. The third category is the most interesting, that lead to buffering is when you combine them both, it's not a perfect summation. And it's not like that, but it's actually partial summation. Because gene A sent part of its output to protein A. When you, gene B sent part of its output to protein A. And when you remove protein A, okay, part of the output is blocked, but it's have another side to go to it. And you can detect this by this result. Unfortunately, as I said, it's not as bad as it should have been. Unfortunately, when we try to generate those double mutants, the yeast is dead. It's too much for the yeast. But luckily, we discover that we have many drugs that are known specific to a protein in our network. So the trick we use is grow those mutants fine, and then hit them with the drug. And look how fat they are. But before using the drug, that drug has to fulfill two criteria to make sure it's specific. The first thing, it has to produce the same fat level as when its target is produced. And then if you take its target, it's already mutant, and you hit it with the drug, you should not get any increase in the fat. The, path is the, same. the pathway is already blocked. You are, not break you are breaking something already broken. Only a drug that passes through selective criteria, that it produces the same fat level as its target when it's removed, and it does not enhance the fat level, when you take those mutants and hit them with the drug, does not enhance. Only those two, dr only those two only drugs that fulfill those two criteria will be carried to our analysis. And we are lucky because we found close to five drugs that fulfill this criteria. The first drug is U0126, rabomycin, chloroquine, contalin A, and sirilinin. Here, this is a control. First, the criteria here, you can see all those drugs enhance fat when you no incubate normal yeast with them. And sirilinin is an inhibitor of fatty acid synthesis, so that's why it becomes thin. And here's a second experiment to show that the drug does not have side effect. Uh, TC089 is a component of the ribomycin complex, and when you mutate this, you have a fat, fatter than normal. But see, when you take TC089 and hit it with ribomycin, no enhancement, because the pathway is already broken. All those drugs have to fulfill this criteria. Does that make sense? I hope so. But anyway. So, now let's take our yeast, 91 mutants, and hit them with the drugs, one by one, and see what kind of a result we got. And here I show basically only uh, two drugs, but the analysis was done to all of them, Kencomycin and U0126. Here, basically, independent pathway. How many times when we hit the mutant with Contalin A alone, or UZ126 alone, that we have this result? It's perfect summation of fat, which indicates independent pathway. Not that many. Very few. Very few nodes in those two drugs seem to be independent. What about the second? That the two, uh, uh, pro the target and the protein are in the same pathway. And the prediction here, if you hit it for the drug, it's like, uh, it's the same, like it's the same fat. The fat is not enhanced. How frequently do you see it? Very frequently. A lot of the nodes are in the same pathway. What about this, the third possibility, synergism? That when you hit a given mutant with the drug, you have enhancement by the fat, but not that much. And this is the portion that where synergy happens. It happens 30 to 40% of the time. So the take home message from this, that we do have some buffer and we do have some robustness. But another take home message that seems that the nodes are highly connected with each other and communicating with each other. Not everybody just doing its own, sh uh, its own thing separately from the rest. Another thing that this line of experiment has shown us, as I said, that, that a lot of the nodes seem to be involved in the same pathway. Here for the pathway of U0126, here is the pathway of kinomycin. 
And again, the same phenomena. Things in the same pathway tend to belong to different modules. And what we notice is that we do have nodes that are common between different pathways that can function as a both of signal integration. Okay. Now, the traffic flow. This is the third prediction. As I told you, that if our network is scale free, then we would predict that most of the path will lead to the hubs. And those hubs are the most highly connected nodes. Is that what we observe? <coughs> Basically, how many nodes that are in the same pathway have this relationship? That when hit them in the drug, there is no enhancement. We've noticed that the things that function as a point of convergence to every drug we examine, the red, are not the most highly connected nodes. Where things that are highly connected in blue, rarely do they function as a point of convergence. I don't know if that makes sense or not. So we did not see the relationship that this model predicts if the things that highly connected node will function very frequently as a point of convergence for the drug. No, we did not see that relationship between the two. Okay. What is the conclusion? We found a large interconnected protein network that regulates fast storage in the budding yeast. The importance of a given protein to the output of the network is best explained by its cast centrality property. The network has a topology that combines modular Weisrogat models with the overlapping subnetwork architecture that endowed it with multifunctionality. But again, the surprise thing is we predicted things in the same module will involve the same thing, but we did not see that. We see actually a subnetwork architecture within, within our network. There, there exists a signal communication integrating among multiple signal pathways within the network that is consistent with the small world property of mass communication. However, uh, also there is attenuated response to multiple perturbation. It's consistent with the idea that the network structure buffer it against external or internal perturbation. But there is no correlation between the number of connections that a protein makes and how frequently does it function as a point of convergence for multiple pathways. Now here's the basically the essence of the collaboration between me and Mike about a future project that got funded by ICGEP. The first thing that we are interested in is to determine the dynamic pattern of our network under different conditions. The network you have seen is this is when there is steady state, the yeast is growing just fine. But, but what we and me and Mike are interested in is how does the structure of the network change when you subject the yeast to different conditions? Is protein A still part of the network? Is there a new protein, protein phi, that became part of the network? We don't know and we want to examine that. And luckily for us, yeast, because it's such a well-established uh, uh, model, every single uh, gene in the network can be is tagged with a tap tag that we can use it to pull it down from yeast extract. And we subject the yeast to different conditions. And the hope is by running it on LCMS, we can see which proteins are now are part of the complex and which part of the protein are not part of the complex. And then we will have a total profile of the network architecture under different conditions. And the hope is when we end the series of experiments, we form a catalog that this is how the network look on rich, rich media. This is how the network look when you start it. This protein is no longer part of this network. Or this protein is no longer part of this network under aerobic growth. Or a new protein being added to the network when you grow it in the defined media with ribomycin. So that's the first goal of the collaboration between we and Mike. And this is something that hasn't been done yet. So we consider ourselves are kind of you know, doing something quite unique now in the field of protein-protein interaction. The second thing we want to do is to further define the connection in the network. Now, there is something here. The data that I show you, it tell you A bind to B bind to C. But the truth of the matter, we cannot be definite about that. We all know they co-precipitate with one another. But we are not confident that A bind to B and C. There's a chance that A function is just a bridge between A and C. And we want to find this architecture very well. And the way we're going to do it, again, using the tab DAG, pull the protein, cross-link in it, and then send it by mass, by mass spectrometry, and it would tell us, OK, A and B bind to each other in this domain, and so on. So basically, the red protein is really not a bridge between this and this. It's not binding the green with the blue. And hopefully, with those set of experiments, we can define this architecture. Once we find the binding domain, then we can do a, knife, a, a yeast knock-in in which we remove this domain. And then we can confirm 
that is domain disimportant. We expected this result now. If we knock in, we identify this domain using this experiment, and now we will remove it. And the first thing we should see, if everything goes well, that the, that the blue protein is no longer binding, but the protein is still there and binding to the green and the, uh, and the magenta protein. Now, once we define that, now we will do something really, really exciting and interesting. What we're going to do here, we know that when you remove the red protein, all of it, this is how fat the yeast is. But after divide, uh, identifying the domain of interaction and remove it now, we want to examine, are, are those yeast fat and by how much? When now it's, uh, now it's only missing the connection with the blue. And the hope is that you say, oh, it's fat, but not as much. But at the end of the day now, using this fat level, you can actually now put a value of how much a signal coming from the red to the blue. So again, it's a serial approach. The first thing, identifying where the two proteins bind with another. And once we identify that domain, we knock it out. And then examine knocking out that domain only, not the entire protein, on the fat level. And by simply measuring the fat level now, we can put a figure of how much this red protein is communicated to the blue protein. And also, we can know now that we can make sure, if we block this domain, that uh, is there a subtask that will be blocked? when you remove that domain. This is also related to this experiment. And the hope is, at this work progress, we already managed to stop here, that we divine the importance of a given protein to overall network output. We managed to identify the subtask and where do they fit in the network. But when this work is done, hopefully we can basically put a value in the signal coming from the connection emanating from this protein. Some connection might be more important than the others. We might discover at the end of the work that we always deal with all or none. Either all those proteins together, or none of them is put together. But we really don't know. We literally don't know. Okay? And this experiment, this, path, this method, will allow us to basically decipher it. And once we have this entire information, we can do a, a good a computational model of those old parameters to predict signal flow within a biological system. And we like to think this is something that is simple, but nobody has done before. And we have the right system to address that. Okay. I'd like to acknowledge some of the people that worked with me in Caltech. Professor Kaizen, Patrick Arb, a wonderful lab technician. Christopher Armand was a mathematician that helped us in our analysis. Noha Olsman, by informatics. Shirid Girgis, who is now a grad student in Harvard. I wish him the best of luck. And this work was supported by Life Science Research Foundation, the Paxter Postdoc Fellowship, NIH R01 and IH R21, to work for both me and Professor Kaizen. Thank you. I hope I didn't take too much time. <coughs>